Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our next round of uh, Fellows Lightning Talks. We're uh, excited to hear what, what the fellows are working on. Um, uh, first up is uh, Rafael Way. Um, whenever you want to get started, go ahead. Okay. Hi, my name is Rafael Way, and I'll be um, for my project, I'm doing novel edge classification architectures for charge particle tracking with graph neural networks. And my mentors are um, Killian Lirid and Gage Dazut. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about um, what tracking is in general. So the Large Hadron Collider, as you're all familiar with, like engages in charge particle tracking experiments. So with tracking, you can um, try to track like the positions, velocities, and trajectories of particles over time. And uh, tracking data that I've been using anyway is presented as graphs where the particle hits are nodes and that trajectories are presented as edges. So the edges would represent where like a two nodes connect with each other. And then um so like track reconstruction is essentially connecting the dots. So um this image shows like the first image shows a transverse view of um, a transverse views of a generic particle tracker. And as you can see, you can see like the um, particle coming in and then um, breaking apart into two separate particles going into two different directions. And uh, the second image shows, um, and then this second image shows like um, what they call like an unrolled RZ view. So it's still the same particle, but in, like a different direction. And then this third image shows the edges and nodes that I was talking about earlier, where the blue part are the edges. So, and then the red parts are the particle heads. So um, graph neural networks, we're trying to propagate information between connected nodes. And then the, we use a transformation function um, here to combine the aggregated information with our current nodes representation. And the fun function used um, that we use going forward is what we call like a graph convol convolution layer. And um, for our out of what prediction inference tasks such as nodes or edge classification. So this is a generic um, neural network. So we have like an input and output and we have multiple hidden layers up to you to define them. And then in between them, we have a rectified linear unit, which is an activation function to help solve the vanishing gradient issue. So as more layers, as um, we use more layers, as more layers use like certain activation functions are added to neural networks, the gradients of the loss function approaches zero, which makes the network hard to train. And then edge classification. So in in our case, we're predicting the label and attribute of edges. So we're trying to find the probability of an edge existing or not. So the probability ranges from zero to one. And um, a model that I will be using going forward, again, as I said, is called like a, graph, a convolution network. And it takes edge attributes as inputs and then passes through linear layers with um, rectified linear unit activations, which I have talked about earlier. And then we also use the sigmoid activation to uh, um, output the probability of an edge belonging to a certain class. So the class would be like zero or one, which means whether it exists or not. And then also ROC curve, which is a receiver operating character curve. And then AUC is just area under curve. So that assesses the performance of the classification model. And um, essentially visualizes the trade-off between its true positive rate or false positive rate across different classification threshold. And by true positive, I'm talking about the probability that an actual positive test positive and um, a false positive or a false negative would incorrectly predict a positive or negative class respectively. And these are the two equations we use to get um, like true positive rate, which is true positive over true positive plus false negative, and then false positive rate, which is false positive over false positive plus true negative. And then AUC quantifies the overall performance of a classifier across all possible thresholds. 
And then this is an example of like an ROC curve that I made using oversimplified event data. So as you can see, we're plotting false positive against true negative. And then in this instance, the area under curve is 0 0.93. So going forward, I plan to incorporate like a GN GNN tracking system. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, any questions for Rafael? Uh, uh, Killian or Gage, do you want to add anything to what she spoke about? Um, <laughs> so we obviously don't have any questions. <laughs> um, but maybe you could like, explain a little bit um, about, so what does it mean for an edge? I, I'm not sure if that was um, clear for everyone to understand what it means for an uh, edge to be true or false, so um, about the objective um, of edge classification. Oh, a true or false would essentially mean whether an edge exists or doesn't. Right, so um, maybe to, to look at the rest of the audience in. So um, in this approach to tracking, we start from a kind of pre-constructed um, graph, like built through some relatively simple principles. So there's a lot of um, connections that connect uh, two hits of different particles. So they are not part of a real track, but it's just random connections that are from this initial graph building step. And then the objective of edge classification is to prune these edges so that in the end, we only have edges left over that connect hits belonging to the same particle. So we really see this track as uh, lots of linear segments um, in, in the graph. So um, maybe that was already clear. I uh, just wanted to make sure that's uh, explained. Okay. Uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, up next is Chris. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, morning for me because I'm in California. My name is Chris Selgren. I am an undergraduate physics student at UC Santa Barbara. And this summer, I'm working on a project entitled Improving Tracking Algorithms in a Muon Collider Detector under the advisement of Simone Pagan Griso of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and Sergio Gindiariani from Fermilab. Um, so I'll start by just giving some introduction to what a muon collider is and why it's relevant. So the history of particle physics experiments um, has been roughly divided into two types over the past 50 years, electron colliders and proton colliders, which are shown in the plot to the right. Um, can you still see my screen, by the way? Yeah, you're fine. Great, thanks. So electron machines offer a much cleaner environment because they're fundamental particles, we can study the products of their interactions directly, which makes them very useful for precision measurements. However, because electrons are light charged particles, they lose a significant amount of energy to synchrotron radiation when they're accelerated in a ring. So it's difficult and impractical to use electrons to explore the energy frontier. However, um, hadron colliders, on the other hand, use heavier composite particles like protons, so they're able to be accelerated to higher energies, such as the LHC. However, um, because hadrons are composite particles, only a fraction of the center of mass energy of the particles can be harnessed for the interactions. So a muon collider sort of gets the best of both worlds. Because muons are 200 times heavier than electrons and their fundamental particles, they lose about 1.6 billion times less energy during acceleration. Um, and because they're fundamental particles, a 10 TeV muon collider could, for example, have the same effective center of mass energy as a 60 or even 100 TeV hadron collider. Um, but the specific amount would depend on the physics of the interaction that we're looking at. Um, so a muon collider offers both the luminosity and the energy to conduct energy frontier discovery experiments, as well as precision measurements in one machine, overcoming the historical divide between these two different approaches. Um, and because of these capabilities, a muon collider has the best reach out of any collider for addressing the biggest questions in physics right now, including the origin of dark matter, the origin of the Higgs, the hierarchy problem, and others. Um, and a muon collider also provides a lot of synergy with other experiments. And finally, because of the compact design, 
the muon collider has the potential to be the most efficient and uh, sustainable high energy physics machine to succeed the LHC. So if it's so great, why have we not built it yet? Um, the muon collider has a uh, several sets of challenges that have blocked it historically, um, but because of recent developments are able to be sort of re-examined. So the main challenge that surrounds the muon collider is the short lifetime of muons. They only last about 2.2 microseconds in the rest frame. That's the mean lifetime. Um, and this historically has posed a lot of issues with the production and cooling process because muons have to be concentrated in a compact beam after their creation from the proton and pion beam. Um, but another big problem is posed by the uh, detection apparatus process. So because so many of these charged particles are decaying, there's a huge quantity of low energy charged particles that are entering the detector apparatus that have to be discriminated against. And this is known as the beam induced background. So the figure below gives a sense of the magnitude of this background. Um, it is sort of like looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, however, while the beam induced background issue is difficult, it is not totally unprecedented and it's definitely not impossible. The density of hits in the beam induced background is about 10 times larger than the pile up at the Large Hadron Collider, which means that we do need novel approaches, but it's far from infeasible. Um, and so the randomness of the background provides good handles for being able to discriminate against the beam induced background. Um, so it has a the BIB or beam induced background has a particular spatial and timing signature that allows for good handles for discrimination. So for example, by using cuts on timing alone, the hit density can be reduced by a factor of two. And that's what's shown in this top figure above. And then for analyzing the spatial background, there are multiple different tracking algorithms that are being considered. The classic uh, tracking algorithm for a lepton collider is the conformal tracking algorithm. Um, but because of the really high multiplicity of hits in the muon collider environment, uh, the conformal tracking is pretty impractical and it takes about a week to process a single event. So another design that's been considered is using a double layer design with conformal tracking, um, which would allow for the proximity of two close layers to give directional information that can be used for discrimination. And that's what's shown in the second slide below, or what's shown in the figure below. Um, so, and you can see from the pink and the green that uh, using the double layer approach can significantly decrease the hip multiplicity. Um, but this approach is also difficult in practical construction and the construction of these layers is quite expensive. So another tracking approach that is being used, considered is combinatorial Kalman filtering, which is used in the ACTS or a common tracking software package. And ACTS, it was designed for efficiency. And so it provides a much needed computational efficiency boost um, and speed. Um, and running with ACTS has shown some success. However, the tracking can still use a uh, significant improvement. So that sort of brings me to my work this summer. Um, and so the goal of this project is to optimize the parameters for the ACTS tracking system. The algorithm relies on some default input parameters, which still need optimization. And these include uh, parameters like the size of the interaction region and the maximum closest hit added at each layer, as well as others. And so in this project, I'm going to be determining a standard set of parameters that can be used in tracking, which will involve defining the metrics for performance, evaluating the performance, and packing the algorithms for use, and that can be exported for the rest of the collaboration. So I actually only started a couple of weeks ago. So a lot of the work that I've done so far has been familiarizing myself with the software environment that I'm using. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit just briefly about some of the work that I've been doing so far. So the project that I'm working on right now is updating the track performance measurement with a different handle, which is cluster size. So the particles are going through the detectors that are made up of these small pixel elements. Um, and a lot of times they're hitting multiple pixels at once, and uh, that's what is known as a cluster. And these clusters, as you can see on the right, are pretty heavily correlated with, or the size of these clusters is correlated with the angle uh, that the particles are coming in at. So this can provide a good handle for discrimination. 
So below are two plots that I made that examine the hit density as a function of these two parameters. And as you can see, there is a pretty solid correlation between the cluster size and the uh, input angle. And with a beam-induced background overlaid, this plot looks basically completely homogeneous. Um, but this, these plots below are run for represent samples of 10,000 events of single muon events. Um, and so placing cuts on uh, like placing cuts on the which of ev which events are allowed to pass these cuts of um, cluster size and, and angle. Uh, can still maintain a really high signal efficiency. So as you can see in the plot on the right, that's with the cuts applied, uh, and it still maintains about over greater than 99% signal efficiency, um, but it actually can cut down the size of the beam-induced background by about 70%. So what I'm working on right now is using this cut to update the plot in the previous slide, the one with the green and the pink, um, to instead of using the double layer filter to instead use the cluster size filter. Um, and then another thing that I'll be working on next is moving the tracking algorithm performance to a 10 TEV collider design. So the collaboration for the Muon Collider uh, has considered multiple designs for different physics schools, uh, but the tracking algorithms and their performance tracking is still running on the 1.5 TEV design. So next, what I'm going to be doing is moving these tracking algorithms to the updated design and then Afterwards, I will move forward on um, the optimization of the tracking parameters. Okay, that is my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chris. A any questions for Chris? Um, do um, uh, Simone or Sergo, do you wanna add anything to Simone or? or... Yeah, no. I... I, yeah, no, I think Chris ex explained pretty well. Uh, maybe just to say that Chris has been ramping. So he he has started um, probably later than most of the others. So the, the, the period shifted a little bit. He's been ramping up very quickly. So I'm looking forward to the to the next few weeks. Uh, great, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, um, Hubert. You're up next. Track reconstruction again. Yes, this seems like a popular topic today. Um, uh, the, my name is Hubert Pugslis, and I am an undergraduate student at the University of Florida, uh, and I'm currently working under Dr. Philip Chang, who is also at the University of Florida. Uh, my project is titled Augmenting Line Segment Tracking with Graph Neural Network. Now, as you, uh, as we have already talked about what track reconstruction is um, from Rafilwe, um, uh, I'll just summarize it very quickly. Track reconstruction is just, as the name suggests, um, the process uh, that allows us to understand the uh, the paths of the particles produced in a particle-particle collision, and which allows us to tell uh, tells us a little bit more about the characteristics of the particles, such as their paths and velocities. Now, notoriously, this is one of the most resource costly steps in the overall computing processes. Um, at the CMS uh, detector. Um, if you look at the chart on the right, about half of the RICO portion, which is a purple part, and half of the RICO sim part is for track reconstruction, which makes up about 30% of the total CPU resources needed for the HL LHC. Now, um, this is a problem because if you look at the chart on the left, um, the without any R&D improvements, the resources needed uh, will exceed the predicted annual resource increase for computing resources. Uh, hence, there is significant need to reduce the resource cost of a process such as track reconstruction um, in order to meet the um, um, within budget resource usage for the HLHC. Now, one of the solutions is the um, paralyze, parallelizing the track reconstruction algorithm um, Dr. Chang, uh, with his colleagues, developed the line segment tracking, a tracking al algorithm for the CMS detector that is parallelizable with both CPUs and GPUs. Now, the conventional um, tracking algorithms are not easily parallelizable. Um, however, there are ongoing efforts in this area um, that are promising. However, this solution looks at implementing GPUs, which um, 
have a significant predicted increase in performance if you look on the chart on the right, unlike CPUs. Um, and implementing both of these will likely uh, reduce the overall cost of the line step and tracking track reconstruction in the future. Now, um, because this is a parallelizable um, algorithm, it lends itself well to machine learning. Um, hence is why we are trying to implement a machine learning based uh, GPU and CPU powered um, track reconstruction uh, algorithm. Uh, if, uh, specifically, the, uh, what the LSD does is produces a bunch of possible paths of the particles produced, which you see is on the left, all of the possible gray paths connected by the nodes or the detectors and the edges, which are the possible tracks in gray. Um, and we are able to use a graph neural network to differentiate between the real segments um, and the fake segments, the yellow and red segments. Now, what have I been doing so far? Um, I've been looking at uh, performance testing for uh, the GNN initially. Uh, because the project is still in its early, earlier stages, I've mostly been familiarizing myself with the so software we're using. Um, however, I've also performed the performance testing, such as on the left, you see some of the curves uh, that um, differentiate the true versus false um, edges that the graph neural network differentiated. Um, and also, I have been doing hyperparameter optimization. Um, as was discussed a little bit earlier, just tweaking the parameters in order to produce the most favorable um, differentiation by the graph neural network. On the left is a, the few possible rock curves that um, uh, vary the end message passing rounds. Um, and on the right is just the test loss and epoch curves for um, the same end message passing round variation. Um, some of the further uh, future objectives that we have for this project is normalizing the parameters um, in order to produce more stability in the training process, as well as further optimization of the other hyperparameters. Thank you so much. Um, any, any questions for Hubert? Uh, yes. Um, I was wondering, so I happened to play around with the exact same data set probably as you did. And I was also looking at um, the initial line segment section. Oh, could you keep sharing your screen? Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> sorry. And I was wondering if you ever contrasted, so you seem to be like doing like a full-fledged graph neural network, whereas I was trying to do something very simplified where I would just take um, node attributes and edge attributes and then just do like a few fully connected layers, like just a simple MLP, like no message passing. And I think I would get like a rock curve that's probably not much worse than this. I'm not 100% sure if it's really the same data and then some other subtleties. So did you ever check to just compare your graph neural network with just a very simple, uh, basically just node plus edge feature based um, fully connected layer thing? I have not done that as part of my project, mm -hmm. um, but um, I know that um, the current performance that you see, one of the issues that we have with the project is there was a initial performance test done um, by Dr. Chang himself, mm -hmm. and it outperformed these curves quite significantly. Um, so one of the ongoing objectives is trying to recreate that performance. But um, as you suggested, we will probably likely try um, the simplified version to see if it was a problem with the uh, our implementation of the graph neural network or the da data set itself. Yeah, I see. I was, I was wondering, sorry, I, I, in case other people have uh, questions, feel free to jump in. But I was wondering about, um, so what's the number of parameters you have in your graph neural networks? Like, or how big is this whole thing we're, we're talking about here? Um, like in terms of, yeah. I believe order of magnitude of 10,000 uh, or 100,000 parameters. I'm sorry, that's a big range. Uh, I don't quite remember <laughs> it off the top of my head, but um, it's a, a lot of parameters. 
Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll, I might follow up um, offline because um, I also have some interest to, to use that uh, data in some slightly other uh, approach. Thank you. Yeah, of course. That was a great Thank talk. You. All right. Any other questions for Hubert? All right. Uh, thank you, Hubert. Uh, up next is Avi. Thank you. My name is Avi Kaufman. I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Iowa, um, and I am mentored by Vincent Grone and Quillen Hong. Um, and my goal is basically to, or the title is to understand data popularity and optimization access. So basically the problem is, is that we have a huge amount of data from the Large Hadron Collider from run three and definitely run four. Um, and that results in over 10 million tasks being submitted each year, which means that we have to create an efficient method for um, storing each data set and file and making it um, efficient for people to request them and then do tasks on them. So um, what is data popularity? That is a crucial component of this um, project. Data popularity is basically a metric showing how often a data set or file is used um, within a certain time period. This can be really important for our goal, which is to increase optimization for access time. Um, and our end goal is to basically create a neural network, which can determine based off of information of the data sets, uh, how long it takes or, or the reuse time for each data set or file, and then we can load them into a thing called a decache. So a decache is um, a intermediate cache between the entire database uh, of Atlas and the user requesting a task. Um, it's much faster, but it's also considerably smaller, um, which means that we have to prioritize certain data sets over other ones. Um, which means that a primary goal, which you can see right here, is to develop a policy or an algorithm which can help us determine which files should stay in the cache and which files shouldn't be in the cache um, at a given day, which is why the reuse time is important, because if we can calculate a um, efficient and highly accurate reuse time, then we can know which days we should have certain files and data sets in the decache and which days they shouldn't be in the decache. So to calculate data popularity, we have um, a, huge, <laughs> a huge database from Atlas Panda, which gives us a ton of information on data sets and um, tasks. And all of that information can be used to kind of uh, create an algorithm to determine which data sets are more popular and which ones aren't. You can see here that these four tables below are gonna be our more popular data sets to be used. And uh, there are plenty more, but these are the ones that I, ha I have decided to show for today. So when we do that sort of data analysis from Atlas Panda, we can see um, that user analysis jobs are gonna be far and away the most uh, difficult to manage. Uh, what I'm calling in this uh, central production jobs are basically jobs that are planned beforehand or have some sort of predictable behavior um, on the other hand, user analysis jobs, which is that green that you see on the bottom, are much less predictable. Um, and therefore, we have to use a neural network or some sort of algorithm to help us predict them. Um, and then thus use that reuse time that we get from that algorithm to properly implement it into the decache. So that is a high priority for us. As you can see here, um, this is a graph showing the difference between the optimum uh, byte miss ratio and uh, something called an LRU. The LRU is called the least, fre uh, least frequently reused um, or least recently used um, data set algorithm and a caching algorithm that is very common for people to use. Um, and in this case, it's gonna kind of be our benchmark for future success. It's actually pretty hard to beat this, um, even though you can see that the optimum is quite a ways um, more efficient than the LRU. It's pretty hard to get more um, efficient than the LRU just because of uh, 
the randomness and um, lack of predictability of user uh, tasks. Um, just to clarify, byte miss ratio is basically when somebody um, requests a data set or a file that is not in the decache, it's obviously going to take longer um, because then the Atlas database has to load that file from the, the database, the larger set, um, and not the decache. And so like, like we said before, the decache is a lot more efficient and therefore we consider that to be a byte miss. Other popular uh, caching algorithms um, include these mentioned here. Uh, LFEU, MRU, random replacement, ARC, LIRS, uh, 2Q, and CLOCK. However, um, it is much more common for people to use the LRU, and it tends to be more efficient, um, specifically for um, large data sets that have a lot of use cases. So when we look at uh, data that comes from that Atlas Panda tables that I was talking about before, we can see that the, the distribution of accesses for data sets are hugely skewed. Um, we have a small number of data sets that get up to that um, 6,000 to 10,000 accesses. Um, and then you have a large number of data sets that have very few accesses. And this can be very important to help us discriminate between um, popularity of data sets and then thus to help us determine reuse time. Here we have a group uh, that actually did a research um, study um, and they performed a k-means cluster on the data sets um, over a period of I believe six months and they um, took a three month period of time where they determined present accesses and then another three month period of time um, of which they determined to be future accesses. And then they used that data um, to create this graph here. So you can see that the, there are two specific clusters here. We have the larger one on the bottom left, which is gonna be your less commonly used um, data sets. And then you have that smaller, but um, higher right, um, cluster and that is going to be your more commonly used data sets and our goal is to use data popularity metrics to make sure that these files are in the decache as much as possible because those are going to give us the most efficient optimization of access. So um, another group used uh, a 90 day study to determine um, whether or not random force would be a efficient and optim optimal way to determine data popularity. Um, you can see here that the root mean squared that comes from uh, this study is 0.34 for regression and 0.12 for classification. For classification, it's pretty decent actually. Um, but this still doesn't outperform the LRU, even though there are a lot of advantages of the random forest, um, which gives us just some context of how difficult this, this task really is. From that um, study, though, we can see here that there are um, some important features to look at when you're determining things. Um, the last read for classification, you can tell, is a really, really important um, feature. So if we're to implement our own neural network, it's definitely something we should look at. Um, and regression is going to be uh, data size for its number one. However, last data set read is also very important. Um, I think I forgot to mention the difference between uh, regression and classification, but you can see here that regression is just predicting the logarithm of reuse distance and classification is just a flat out true or false if there is a reread in the next 15 days. So Rusio and WMS Panda, uh, these are the two, like this is the system for data handling and process that Atlas currently used. Um, you can see that Rusio basically tracks a bunch of data stored um, and, and helps you manage the data and transferring uh, data efficiently is all that stuff goes through Rusio. Um, whereas Panda is more about like scheduling jobs um, and assigning computing resources to um, do tasks most efficiently. Um, as of recently, I have not been able to get an account to access a lot of the data. I'm getting that very soon, but I haven't been able to do a lot of work on this specific project. Um, however, I have been able to do work on uh, parsing for large data sets. And so that's what I've been 
uh, doing for the past couple of weeks. Here's just an example of something I've done. Um, you can see here that these files are very large. An example is this raw data file, which is 69,000 rows with 100 JSON objects per row. So you have 6.9 million JSON objects or a total of 15 gigabytes of data. Um, and what we want out of this is to get the um, information at the bottom. So the issue is that it's very difficult. You can't open large files all at once. Um, and if you are going to parse the data, you have to recognize that each cell is its own JSON object in its CSV. Um, and also JSON objects, uh, specifically these ones, uh, typically will have different formats. So this is gonna take a long time for us to parse through and a lot of uh, debugging to make sure this works. So some format examples, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but you can see that these are all different ones um, and that kind of makes it difficult. So the first problem is that they're formatted incorrectly in this case. Um, so when, you, when you're when you parsing through JSON objects, you want there to be double quotes and not single quotes. Um, and as you can see here, and a, a lot of these cases, you have single quotes instead of double quotes. And so that's something we have to fix. Um, and so a solution to that is basically to import a AST library and use the JSON library as well to convert it from a string to a dictionary and then from a dictionary to a JSON object. Um, and you can see the code here does exactly that. Then our second problem is that we have multiple JSON objects in uh, multiple different formats. Um, and so to try and get the same information um, is difficult. In order to solve this, I have implemented try and catch blocks, um, and that allows us to try and get as much information from as many different formats as possible. So that's what the code looks like here. And then the third problem is that um, with these type of scripts, you really want there to be a lot of flexibility because I'm not just going to do one data set. I'm probably going to run this on multiple data sets and it will be really useful in the future to have just a flexible program that can do this for a bunch of different data sets. So now we're gonna use the sys library to use command line parameters as, instead of hard coding um, the script. And that's what that looks like. And so our output file looks a little bit like this. Um, it's gonna be, uh, instead of a 15 gigabyte file, it's closer to a uh, like 1.5 gigabyte file. So it's still huge. This is just 35 lines, um, but that is uh, what I've done so far. So thank you very much. Thank you, Avi. Any questions for Avi? Uh, Killian? Uh, yeah, so I was wondering, so, from when you train your random forest. So the input data includes the usernames, right? So how does the machine learning model there treat this categorical data? And probably there's like a thousand users or more there, right? So does that work with this kind of model? I don't... I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. I, um, this, the random forests were not conducted by me. It was another research group. Um, oh, okay. But to my understanding, the, the Im implementation of the random forest was specifically for data popularity um, and not um, the larger goal of our group, which is to estimate reuse time. So for them, they're, okay. they're specifically trying to see which data is the most popular. Um, uh, and then they use their results to identify the regression and classification, which was for uh, regression was logarithm of reuse distance. And then classification was uh, predicting a reread in the next 15 days. Um, mm -hmm. But that wasn't their like main goal. So it might not be um, entirely applicable if that's what you're asking. I see. Or maybe they did it user by user. I, I don't know. Okay, interesting. Thanks. Yeah, of course. All right. Anyone else? No. Oh, thank you, Avi. Uh, up next is uh, Volodymyr. Uh, so my name is Volodymyr Svetozeski. I'm a master's student at Tarashevchenko National University of Kyiv. And I'm going to talk about my Iris Hub project, which is a study of the new trigger lines dedicated to the long clean particle detection at the LHCB. Uh, but wait a bit. 
Okay, I, I have a microphone now. But before we'll move to that, I will I would like to talk a bit about the LHCP itself and in particular about the LHCP trigger system and uh, the long paper particles. So uh, the Large Hadron Collider provides uh, 40 million proton-proton collisions per second, which is equivalent to approximately five terabyte uh, per second of data coming from our detectors. And it's obvious that we are unable to save all this data from the economic point of view. And therefore, we need to select only the interesting event. And uh, this job is actually done by hardware, oh, sorry, by high-level trigger systems. At the LHCB, we have two of them. We have HLT1 and HLT2. And together, they are able to reduce the data flow down to 10 gigabytes per second. And uh, what is important there is uh, that LHCB, for the first time, has implemented the uh, high-level trigger system in GPUs, which allows us to completely remove the hardware trigger L0. So the only triggers we have at LHCB are only software-based, HLT1 and HLT2. And also, uh, because we use the GPUs for the HLT1, uh, we need quite a lot of the NVIDIA GPU cards in order to process all the data, and which is uh, actually the 500 NVIDIA GPU cards. And uh, finally, it means also that uh, we need to uh, use the CUDA technology during, the, our, the, during our developments, especially if we are working with the HLT1 stage. All right, uh, the, next, the next point is the long living particles. But just before I would uh, talk about them, I would like to uh, firstly mention the different uh, track types we use at the LHCB. So if you will, talk, if we, if you will take a look at the uh, top right plot, uh, you will see the uh, main three main tracking detectors used at LHCB, which are well over the locator, upstream tracker placed just before the, up, uh, just before the magnet, and the SCPI tracker place it uh, just after the magnet. And together, all three uh, detectors allows us to uh, reliably uh, reconstruct the so-called long tracks or tracks that are leave the hits in all the three detectors. But uh, uh, at LHCB, we have also another types of tracks. Uh, for example, we have the dancing tracks, uh, which uh, leave the hits in the UT and the SCPI and the key tracks, which have the hits only in the SCPI tracker. And therefore, in order to be able to reconstruct the different uh, track types, uh, we need to use actually different uh, algorithms for this. And now let's uh, take a look at the long cleavage particles. Uh, so if you'll take a look, uh, for example, at the uh, lambda p to lambda hama physics channel, and especially at the distribution of the lambda uh, decay vertices Z coordinate, then we quickly notice that uh, almost 51% of the daughter tracks uh, leaves hits in the UT and the SCPI and forming the downstream tracks. And around 37% uh, of daughters leave hits in SCPI tracker only and forming the T tracks uh, correspondingly. And therefore, this means uh, that this means that in order to uh, reconstruct most of the lambda particles as well as some other long linear particles, we, we uh, must uh, have the downstream and the T track reconstruction and the vertex in place. And now let's talk about uh, some of my previous projects in the Iris Hack. So the first project I done uh, was the uh, optimization of the long uh, or the long reconstruction algorithm uh, used at the HLT one stage. So the uh, this algorithm is called called matching algorithm, and it works in a very very simple way. So we basically simply take the track segments from the well and the SCPI. Uh, we extrapolate, uh, for example, pair of these uh, segments to some uh, zeta bending using the straight lines, and then using some uh, uh, equations, we try to uh, evaluate the quality of this exact pair. And based on this quality, we uh, are able to decide whatever uh, this given uh, pair of the well on the skiffy track belongs to the real particle or not. And the point is that during this evaluation of the quality, we use uh, 11 different constant parameters, uh, which initially were uh, simply copied from the HLT2 algorithm, corresponding to HLT2 algorithm. And uh, therefore, the optimization of this parameter for the HLT1 stage was required, and this was the ob an objective of my uh, first iris project. And in the end, uh, we get the uh, cost reduction after the opti optimization around 1.56%. Another uh, Project, uh, another my project that they just have was the uh, downstream vertexing algorithm. So this is what this was the development of that downstream vertexing. And uh, during the development process, we quickly realized that we need to take into account the non-negligible uh, magnet field in the UT region, as you can see on the right uh, plot, right-hand side plot. 
And uh, the simple way to take into account this is uh, to simply use the polynomial approximation for the, tra for, for the trajectories. And uh, actually, we used the uh, polynomials in x uh, coordinate uh, with order up to the two. And the coefficient in front of the uh, last addition, uh, we, it, it was turned out that this uh, has a quite uh, good linear dependence on the q over p, which uh, makes sense because this is just a magnet correction. All right, so the overall uh, vertex in algorithm for the tungsten tracks looks uh, like this. Uh, so we are firstly estimating the zeta position of the original vertex, uh, and then we extrapolating two downstream tracks to this uh, zeta position using our uh, trajectory model. And finally, uh, we are doing some kind of the linear uh, vertex fitting uh, using these extrapolated states, uh, simply because in the uh, closed region around the origin vertex, if this region is uh, small enough, we can use uh, the linear uh, trajectories, and uh, that's actually it. And uh, therefore, this is how the reconstruction of the vertices work. But in order to uh, able to actually get some results, you, uh, you need uh, to define the trigger. You need to define the selection using these reconstructed vertices. And uh, in order to achieve this, we uh, actually developed the two monitoring trigger lines uh, based on the downstream vertex, vertex, vertexing uh, for the k short uh, into two points and for the lambda into proton and the pion. Uh, so this monitoring trigger lines uh, was actually based on the neural network, and uh, because of the very tight throughput requirements, we used a quite small neural network, which used only one hidden layer with seven nodes in it. And in total, we had uh, like 12 input variables. And what we get in the end after the uh, both vertex and the selection is shown on the right-hand side plot. So this is the mass plot, uh, and uh, the blue line uh, corresponds to actually to the signal of our k short and our lambda. So as you can see, it looks pretty, pretty well. And uh, the last thing I would uh, like to mention is actually my current project. So the thing I'm working on right now, and this is the T-Track Vertex Sync algorithm at the Shelty one level. And from the first look, it could be mm, seen that uh, it should be uh, quite similar to the downstream vertex sync algorithm because we have like uh, the similar vertex and similar tracks and so on. But there are a lot of problems here with comparison, in comparison uh, to the downstream. And actually, most of them are coming from the fact that between the origin vertex and the Skify station, we have quite a strong magnetic field. And uh, therefore, we, need, we are not able to uh, simply approximate this uh, binding, this trajectory binding using some kind of the polynomials. But we also cannot use the, uh, for example, Runge Kuta to do this because the Runge Kuta algorithm is quite, quite slow. And remember, we are working at the SLT1 level, which is a uh, fast trigger, which has very, very tight throughput constraints. In addition to this, we also have quite limited momentum information because uh, the only momentum information we are able to retrieve is actually calculated using some uh, Skify heat displacement. And therefore, it has an error uh, about 10%. And finally, uh, we have limited information for the selection. We have a limited amount of the parameters we could use in our, for example, neural network, uh, simply because uh, between the point of the origin vertex and between uh, the uh, well, for example, we also have quite a big distance, a quite strong magnetic field in between, and therefore we are not able to easily assign for each massive particle the corresponding primary vertex, and therefore we are unable to uh, actually get the impact parameter. But nevertheless, uh, we are going to try to solve these uh, problems and to get some uh, vertex in algorithm using the tracks during this hammer, and I hope that we'll get some uh, beautiful results. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Um, one of your mentors, uh, uh, Bridge, are you uh, you're connected? Do you anything you want to add? Uh, nothing else says I'm, uh, I'm in a lot of noise, but I think he covered everything. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next up is uh, Artem. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm Artem Tehavriluk. I'm a first year master's student at Kiev Academic University. My specialization is applied physics and nanomaterials. 
Uh, I am at vice participant of the Ethereum Hub uh, internship. I have been working uh, in, with the same team last year uh, on the project called uh, Detection of Fission Events in HTTPC de Detector. Uh, also, I am participant of the Tukratop internship. It's a collaboration between Ukraine and Germany. Uh, when I grew uh, superconductive super single crystals. Uh, my project's topic is using diffusion probabilistic models for generating drugs from a TTPC dead, dead node detector. My mentors are Dr. Michel Kuchera and Dr. Rahul Ramanujan. Uh, so, uh, what is ATTPC, the Active Target Time Projection Chamber? Experiment is a state-of-the-art particle detector used to study nuclear physics. Uh, the most important thing for our purposes is to know that drugs like this and like this uh, come out of the ATTPC de de no detector, and it is crucial uh, for noise reduction to be able to generate clean, noise-free drugs. Uh, in this picture, we can see two bodied vents, two bodied because uh, only two lines, and three bodied vents. They are clear, they are, uh, have no noise, so uh, you can see them. Uh, the next one is uh, diffusion probabilistic models. Uh, and uh, what do they do? Uh, they convert a pure point cloud into a noisy point cloud and then learn to recreate a clean point cloud like this from the noisy one. Uh, in the picture, you can observe the forward process of adding noise to a pure point cloud until it uh, becomes unrecognizable. Uh, in the second picture, everything is different as a pure point cloud is uh, recreated from a noisy point cloud. It may be not the same, but it's uh, quite similar. The shape is similar, so it's good. And the main, uh, the main idea is to learn the reverse diffusion process that transforms the noise distribution to the distribution of a desired shape. Uh, so our starting point is uh, article diffusion probabilistic models for 3D point cloud generation. And what they did in this article, they had a data set consist of thousands of points clouds of chairs, uh, like this one, planes, tables, uh, and they trained the model to recreate these shapes from a noisy point cloud like this one. Uh, one of the limitations of this model is that it was designed for three-dimensional point clouds while the data from the TTPC uh, is four-dimensional. Uh, this problem uh, was solved by Dr. Michel Kuchera's team as they adapted the model to a four-dimensional representation. Uh, the second limitation of this model is the absence of conditions during generation. Uh, so, for example, in order to generate a in order to generate a point cloud in the form of a chair well, like this one, uh, we need to train this model only on the chairs. And if we wanna uh, generate planes, we need to train this only on planes. If uh, we are gonna to train it on uh, uh, chairs and planes, uh, uh, in the end we will get something like a mixed uh, chair and plane. And uh, that's uh, not what we want. And so my task is to create a conditional point cloud gen gen or gen or generator where the model is trained on all available forms and then it can generate the specific forms. So we want to train our models, for example, on chairs, planes, and tables uh, all, all at once. And then we, when we are uh, going to generate the Point clouds, we want to sp uh, specify, for, for example, I want chairs, I want plane, I want table, and it will get it for us. Uh, so the idea is like this. We have a noisy point cloud plus some conditional encoding, for example, type of event. Uh, we put it in DPM, uh, diffusion probabilistic model, and we get the desired shape. Uh, first, uh, the results uh, are uh, represented here. I just take a, a real two-body events like this. No, they are simulated, but uh, in our terms, they are real. Uh, and I have trained the model to create simulated events. So uh, picture on the right hand is uh, 
simulated events of these events. So they're completely new. And we can see that uh, they're uh, pretty much uh, the same as this. Uh, maybe not so dense, but uh, something near. Uh, and our next steps is adding the condition of what type of uh, event we want to generate. For example, uh, we want uh, two body type. Uh, we put it in the DPM and we get uh, two body events. We want three body, put it in them and we get three body events. Uh, so something like this. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Artem. Any questions for Artem? All right. Thanks again. Uh, next up, uh, Valerie. Yeah. Okay. So uh, my project is development of simulation workflow for for beyond standard standard model phys uh, physics at LHCB. My mentors is uh, Professor Aranza. Youngren from uh, University of Valencia, Spain, and Bridge uh, Jahal, for also from the same university. Uh, I'm bachelor uh, in Kiev National University of Kiev. Uh, yep, probably that's all from title. Uh, okay, first uh, a bit about uh, data flow in uh, LHCB. Uh, in the picture, you can see uh, how it goes. So, and if we do some simulation, uh, at first we use Gauss for particle simulation, and then Bool uh, that we use for digitalization that will be uh, described a bit later. Uh, then it can be used, uh, data can be processed using trigger like in Moore, or uh, it can be gone to DaVinci for also some simple analysis. Uh, for uh, some work, uh, I used next uh, combination. It's like Gauss, Bull, and then DaVinci with possible usage of Moore. Uh, a bit more about uh, everyone uh, in these frameworks. Uh, Gauss is framework that generate primary events and uh, simulate iteration, interaction with detector. Bull is software that uh, makes simulation into virtual detector and converts them in a signal that uh, mimic the real detector. So uh, in such way, output from bool can be used uh, using the same uh, software is like real data. And DaVinci is analysis framework uh, that we used for events processing. Uh, project goal, it's like development of flexible fast frameworks that can be used uh, for generating different models with different properties. Uh, model parameters have to be modifiable. Uh, selection and optimization of output of this uh, framework and also of like uh, a simulation output and development uh, algorithm of new physics finder for Allen also and study of simulation output inside the Allen framework. Uh, so uh, all this uh, simulation that uh, created using uh, this uh, framework also that I'd done before, they used in uh, HLT1 uh, algorithm development. An example of usage, uh, here you can see a signal amount of uh, dark boson uh, depends on different dark boson parameters like mass or lifetime. And for each of this plot, uh, approximately one and half hundred uh, simulation was made uh, using a full chain like Gauss, Bull, and Da Vinci. And uh, it can uh, take a long time to do it. So uh, such uh, framework development will help to make this work much easier and it will be a lot faster. Probably that's all. Oh, thank you, Valerie. Uh, any questions? Hello, my name is Maxim. I'm a bachelor student at Kyiv, and I would like to tell you about my project of implementing machine learning algorithms for network problem identification. My mentors are 
Petya Vasilova and Sean McKee from the University of Michigan. So what kind of network are we talking about? First of all, I'd like to tell you, uh, here you can see uh, the, the Large Hadron Collider located at CERN. There are lots of experiments uh, there, such as CMS, uh, Atlas, Alice, and others. They generate lots of data, which we can then analyze and do our research. But of course, we want um, to be able not only access it from CERN, but from others, uh, other parts of the world, uh, from uh, our home institutions. So for that reason, uh, the, infra the global infrastructure for HEP data, data analysis was created. Uh, here you can see all the sites across the world and the connections between them. It may look a little bit complex, but on the right, you have here the cluster um, of Europe uh, sites. Uh, on the bottom is CERN itself. Here is uh, Germany, France, and uh, um, UK, for example. The middle is uh, America. Middle top is uh, North America and bottom is uh, South America. And on the left, uh, you can see the Asia side. So let's imagine, for example, that we are at Seattle uh, at this site and we want uh, to receive uh, some data for analysis from CERN. So uh, it will go all the way from here. Uh, unfortunately, we can't uh, get the data directly from it. Uh, it, will, it will travel uh, through different sites in Europe and then across uh, the ocean uh, on the internet bridge uh, to North America and then across uh, some more sites to our, uh, to our destination. So if uh, everything, uh, everything is okay, we received uh, our package and everyone is happy. But what about uh, if some problem occurred? For example, uh, we see that our throughput is low uh, that uh, the download uh, speed is uh, low and we don't we're it's too is taking us too slow to get our data um, we're starting to think uh, that there may be some problems uh, in the network but we can't uh, really know uh, where uh, on this uh, last way it happened on which sites exactly so uh, to identify the problems and locate them uh, that was created such a device called Personer. It, uh, it's a device that measures the uh, performance metrics uh, of the specific sites. And it is uh, here you can see all the personas in the world uh, that are located. Um, it uh, generates lots of data of the correlated site, uh, the, its measurements, the throughput, the packet loss, and others. And um, to see the data real time and also to analyze uh, the data which uh, from the past, the platform called Elasticsearch is used. Um, here, uh, different uh, measurements are stored separately uh, in the separate indices. For example, uh, packet loss is measured more frequently than throughput uh, in the shorter periods of time. So they all kept uh, separate. On the screen, you can see the, uh, the measurements for throughput in the interval of five days from March 12th to March 17th. And uh, we have uh, 30,000 uh, hits, meaning measurements uh, in this period of time. And here I've selected uh, a period of three hours uh, between 12 and 15 o'clock, and it has uh, 730 measurements. So, what we can do now here is uh, just look, uh, for example, at throughput here. And uh, if it gets below a certain threshold, uh, it, it uh, shows uh, below average uh, res um, results for this site, we can say, well, uh, there are some problems. But we can't, we can't know for sure uh, where the problem occurs, on which site is, is either it uh, somewhere along the way to this site or it's the site itself. So what we can do is uh, to use, uh, to feed all this data 
all these data, data sets for different measurements uh, into the machine learning algorithms uh, that uh, would be able to, um, we would train them on the problems um, on the data uh, on the problems that already already occurred and which we marked in our data sets uh, with the with the known solutions uh, already how we solved them and uh, after feeding it to the machine learning uh, models we are expecting we are hoping that it would uh, they would show us um, where uh, if any problems would occur in the future they would show us uh, how, um, what type of problem is, is it, uh, what site is affected, and how to solve it. So that's uh, basically all uh, about the introduction about uh, my project I'm, I would be working on this summer. Thank you for attention. Uh, thank you, Maxim. Uh, uh, one of your mentors, uh, Pet, uh, Petya, uh, Petya, are you, do you have anything this, you'd like to add? Um, hi. Um, no, I think uh, he explained very well his project and his goals. So thanks, Maxim. Okay. So, thank, you. thank you. All right. Now on to our final uh, presentation. Uh, Leonid. So hello, everyone. My name is Leonid Yiduch. Uh, I would like to present uh, the project that I will be working on and currently working. Um, it's uh, this project is systemization of energy cost and efficiency of HEP data compression ML algorithm. It's called it Baylor. So the efficient computational resource utilization and management is a big challenge in scientific and industrial research because it mainly affects the time, money, and the environment. And uh, one of the biggest part of the um, uh, this resource management is data preservation. It's a very difficult process because especially in the uh, older experiments and the running one, because it requires a stable storage facilities, like concert energy supplies the finance. Uh, and uh, with the increasing amount of data, it's becoming difficult and difficult. Also, there's a big, massive energy and climate footprint, both of the computational research and ML models. And with increasing data and various deployed uh, AI algorithms, the energy consumption grows and the CO2 emission as well. And uh, uh, so, as you may see on the pictures below, uh, let's take it from the archive papers that analyze uh, ResNet, uh, various ResNet architecture as it were published it's such from 2000, like uh, 12 to, to 2021. It's basically CNN and ResNet. Mm, uh, so, so there's a correlation. I mean, the dependency of the Joes he consumed and time and also the correlation between the, the dependency between the accuracy and gflops so it's increasing increasing and this is uh, it's increasing exponentially so this uh, way how to optimize all of this thing and uh, considering the data preservation one of the solution for this is to use the data compression algorithm and the Baylor is uh, after encoder based framework that is one of the implementation of this idea. Uh, the main problem is data preservation that data moving and storing is very expensive operation and they need to reduce this. Uh, one of the way it is to use some specific hardware, but another way it just to use the software as a data compression. Another, one, another challenge is the CPU challenge. Uh, because uh, the number of flops is growing uh, with the accuracy of the DNN and uh, the forward pass of the typical DNN architecture is uh, very long, becomes, takes more and more time. And so we need to have some uh, way how to optimize this 
to uh, in, by keeping the and improving the accuracy of this model. And to the third one, as I mentioned, the energy consumption uh, and reduction. Um, so we know that uh, uh, the energy consumption is very co uh, is growing, but we need to know we need to track it somehow, and um, it's a bit. Uh, tricky question how to measure the energy consumption, the electricity consumption for the DNN application, what, and also what kind of metrics in, in this case the most representable, and uh, uh, the end how to optimize and develop the green AI or green DNN. So this is a scope of problems and uh, some solutions that uh, are addressed in this project. And more to the details that goes with this project, it precises. So I uh, I want to profile the Baylor on CPU, and by performance a parametric test around the number of epochs, uh, input data size, batch size, estimates the runtime metrics, latencies, bandwidth, and uh, then build the data set that will contain all the possible metrics as it related to the CPU performance. And uh, by having this, you know, find some hotspots and bottlenecks uh, that um, the most extensive uh, operation, the most ex uh, expensive lines or models of Baylor. Uh, and uh, uh, it's concerning the GPU. Uh, the, the same will be done for the GPU um, by trying different profilers. Uh, and uh, also it will be interesting to estimate the temperature uh, of the GPU during the training and inference. And then, then the third part will be energy consumption estimation of Baylor using CPU and GPU. And uh, one of the most widely used uh, tool for this is uh, running average power meter. It's a hardware-based solution for the energy cost estimation for the CPU. Um, is it, uh, I already use it and uh, will uh, uh, will use it uh, uh, in parametric test. And uh, by having this, I would like to check the possible tools uh, to reduce the resource consumption. For example, to use the energy aware pruning or green convolution layer. So this is the goals and uh, concerning the metrics that can describe the DNN performance. So this is pretty a big bunch of the uh, metrics that uh, can characterize the computational resource consumption of the software. It's like a flop, flop per second, also alpha flops. Uh, the multiply addition operations, the CPU GPU utilization in, in percentage, uh, the, uh, clock time, interest time, the memory access time. However, the, uh, some authors uh, claim it's uh, not that much representable in terms if you want to um, see how it correlates with the energy uh, uh, that consumed. Uh, for this reason, uh, the situation is becoming tricky because uh, you can estimate uh, the whole energy that was consumed by application, by module, but uh, it's uh, much more interesting to know how uh, it works in terms of the data moving and uh, uh, for each specific layer and uh, how it uh, works for the uh, CPU, DPU, uh, DRAM, and system, etc. Um, so I did this, some research and find uh, pretty interesting uh, tools and papers that uh, uh, suggest the possible profilers uh, for the DNN models, and they provide some. Um, Benchmark resources, so they are listed here. And I will test it as well. And uh, this one is for the energy estimation. 
and uh, going much more to the details so uh, how the works is uh, done so there's a different ways how to uh, make the experiment but the simple case we have the after encoders that just compress the four vector uh, of the uh, or just or some uh, uh, vector representation of the event of the LC collision and by having the laptop I have the M1 it's possible to just to profile um, estimations the uh, uh, number of the operation and the time in memory consumed so in brief case by using the C profiles the for the training the normal stack of the operation looks like this so this is a nested um, list uh, so the, the, the nested uh, list of the operation for the training and uh, as one of the most expensive operations uh, concerning the time is the backward operation so the back propagation uh, and he, here I tested the linear layer but uh, in the, in practice the convolution layer is the most expensive operation of the DNN training and uh, talking about the compression decompression we have this also different numbers so for the memory in time so with the compression is much more uh, costly but uh, this happens due to some uh, um, coping operations the coping between python and c uh, oh, and here's a brief numbers for the uh, energy cost estimation uh, so this is uh, the first look to this uh, problem and concerning the timeline, uh, actually now I'm working with a student from the Manas from Google Summer Code. He's uh, also doing the profiling with his better framework. And later on, I will uh, the next week I will work with the GPU, and we'll do the GPU tests and compile uh, and we'll compile it to, to the presentation and next two weeks after this i will mainly test the script and code from uh, cardoso uh, this person has some green software uh, tools for the analysis and automation of the gpu energy consumption and uh, by having all of this i will be able to compare my results that i have right now and uh, that i will receive and analyze the data set that i will have uh, yeah, that's how it is so like actually my current status i did the review of the possible profiler for the cpu gpu constructed some reading list and documentation uh, also did the profiling uh, using CPU and spotted some weak points that are related to the um, NumPy error construction and copying uh, of data. It's mainly happens this is, uh, on the way of uh, on the stage of pre-processing of the data uh, and uh, got some number and. I still perform the test for the energy consumption and CO2 emissions during the train inference using CPU GPU. And here's my work in repository. Uh, so thank you for the attention. Do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Leonid. Uh, any questions for Leonid? No. All right. Well, thank you all for uh, for coming. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, everything was great.